Welcome to the Flores Evening Lecture Series again. We're coming to the uh, pointy end of the year, and I'm sure everyone's enjoyed uh, a couple of fantastic grand finals, defend, depending on who you barrack for. Um, I'm in my morning. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which uh, this event is taking place, the lander of the Wundjeri, and pay respect to their elders and families. My name's Tom, and I'm the science communicator here at the Flory. Um, and being somewhat of a geek, I must say, I'm looking forward to tonight's lecture, I think the most out of our entire series this year, and they have been great lectures this year. So welcome and thank you to Professor John Furness and Dr. Martin Stebbing for taking the time to talk to you tonight about diet, evolution, gut health, and function. Um, John's gonna open the proceedings, as I said, followed by Martin, and then we'll get some closing remarks from John. So Professor Furness is head of the Digestive Physiology and Nutrition Lab here at the Flory. Um, his research over the years has concentrated on the autonomic nervous system, particularly the control of digestive function and on drug development. Um, John's stellar career has been acknowledged by his election um, as a fellow to the Australian Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. Um, and John's received numerous awards throughout his career, including the Australian Centenary Medal. Uh, Martin is um, very interested in the neurobiology of neuropathic pain, which is a rather hot topic in neuroscience at the moment, and in the physiology of sensory systems in the periphery and in the spinal cord. So the aim of his research is to develop a better understanding of the function of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, that's the back part of your spinal cord, and looking at the changes in the nervous system that lead to neuropathic pain. Um, he has a multidisciplinary approach uh, to investigating how sensory neuron, um, neural circuits are wired up and how they indeed function, as you'll see in the title. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome John and please give him a, round, a warm welcome. Thank you. So, thank you all for coming along tonight. This is a fairly big topic. We're going to skim over it a bit, but I hope you enjoy it and we'll have some time for questions at the end. Now, I'd like you to remember two things at the beginning and think about them during this lecture. For every one of you, every muscle cell in your body, every cell, every hair on your head comes from what you eat. So what we eat is incredibly important to us and we have to think about it in those terms. The other thing is to remember as we go through the lecture is that what you are now is not what your ancestors were. You evolved from something quite different. And in that evolution, we've had to cope with changes in diet and dietary availability. So our foods have changed and our foods are essential. So let's start with that and then we'll move on and now talk about a few concepts that uh, are important to us. So the critical concept, concepts to get in our heads a little bit is that modern humans obtain their food from a very wide range of sources and modern humans take about 80% of their diet in the form of processed foods. Ancient humans, of course, didn't have supermarkets. So this is something that we've had to deal with. The other thing, the next point is that the anatomical and the physiological differences from other mammals uh, makes us able to, use, to consume processed foods, which uh, they, they couldn't. And this consumption of foods, which, which is extra to the old repertoire that we had, has forced uh, evolutionary change. And then Martin's going to talk a lot about this. The gut, the brain and bacteria are a triad in our body. The gut talks to the brain, the brain talks to the gut, and the bacteria talk to the gut. And that is wrapped up in the way we are and the way in which uh, we uh, cope with certain diseases of the gut. So, um, now, every animal is similar. Every vertebrate must achieve the same endpoint, must take in its food, must break up the food into molecules, and those molecules must supply the building blocks for every cell in their body, the structural building blocks, must provide the nutrients and it must provide the factors that allow the, the parts of the body to interact. How every species does this is different. So we, we all exist as animals on, on different diets and we have different strategies to deal with them. And these differences are important. They determine a diet appropriate to a, a particular species. Now, we couldn't eat, live on the, the food of a cow and a cow couldn't live on the food of a cat. 
So we're specialised. And this determines the, broad, the range of foods we can eat. And we as humans have adapted remarkably to take a bigger range of foods because we can process the foods. So we're quite different uh, from all other mammals. And the differences determine the efficiency of the food uh, intake and tolerances, what you can tolerate in your food. So here's a little picture or series of pictures which I want you to look at carefully. This is the shape of our gut. A stomach, a long small intestine, a very small, large bowel. This is a chimpanzee, very closely related to us, with its stomach, small intestine, and its large intestine is quite big. Then there are other species, like the bovines, the, the cattle, that have a very large foregut, much bigger in proportion than, say, a human or a pig and a horse with a very large hind gut. So all these species have diverged and they have specialisations that allow them to take the foodstuffs they do. The gastrointestinal tract, the digestive system, has a broader range of variation amongst mammals than any other part of our body. If you look at the heart and the blood vessels, they operate pretty well the same in all mammals. But if you look at the gastrointestinal tract, it is very divergent. So, um, this is a, so modern humans consume a very wide range of foods. Now, animals are given names for what they eat. So chimpanzees are regarded as omnivores, and you'll see a picture of a chimp eating some meat later. Um, koalas eat leaves, they're, they're, they're folivores, and cows eat um, uh, grasses and herbivores. The panda is a really interesting animal. Pandas used to be carnivores. And through food restriction and long periods of living where they did, they ended up uh, being herbivores. But they still have a carnivore gut. And giant pandas are one of the most inefficient animals of all uh, in consuming their foods. And they're very delicate, as you know. Very hard to breed and hard to look after. So some animals have enormous gastrointestinal tracts. This, this is a hippopotamus. And you see the absolutely enormous stomach that it has because it, it has to eat huge amount of grasses uh, to digest and it is continually eating and digesting <laughs> all its life, 24 hours a day. And uh, if we now look at a comparison of animals that comes on from the slide I showed you before, this shows the dependence on bacterial digestion. And what is shown here is the colon, the cecum, and the stomach. So in the bovine, or the cows, almost all the food is in the stomach because they have these huge four stomachs as ruminants that are taking in grasses. In an animal like a horse, they have a huge area of the gastrointestinal tract with bacterial digestion in the colon, large intestines I showed you. But look how interesting it is for human. Here's the human. Very little of our gastrointestinal tract uh, is involved in bacterial in digestion, that is bacteria producing, uh, breaking down food for our benefit. And we're very similar to a cat or a dog in terms of the amount of the gastrointestinal tract that is involved in bacterial digestion. We have adapted in a different way and the way we've adapted makes us a very efficient eater and consumer of a processed food. Pigs are often thought to be close to humans, but actually more than 50% of their digestion uh, is bacterial. The amount of energy we get from the work of bacteria in breaking down food, a horse gets almost half its energy from that source. A human gets about 6%. We get almost nothing uh, from bacterial digestion. Dogs are even uh, more parsimonious than we are in terms of what they get. And this is an example of the specialisation among species. So this is cats. So cats, they don't have a capacity to eat carbohydrate. They don't have sweet taste receptors. They can't tell. They can't detect carbohydrate. They don't adapt to carbohydrate. When we eat carbohydrate, uh, 
enzymes and transporters are induced in our bodies to deal with them. Cats lack that. And if you look at the carbohydrate, major carbohydrate handling enzyme, which is pancreatic amylase, the levels in the pancreas in dogs, pigs, sheep and horse are quite high, and cat very low. So many mammalian species are highly specialised in what they're capable of eating. The koala is probably one of the most specialised of all animals. It only eats eucalyptus leaves, it doesn't eat anything else. And this is a koala gastrointestinal tract. It's almost all large intestine. It has hardly anything else because it has to have tannin digesting bacteria that digest the food. And interest, a very interesting feature of the koala is that it will not live unless it's colonised by the correct bacteria, which includes this rather unusual one, Lone Pinella koalarum, which comes from the Lone Pine Sanctuary. Uh, but if they don't have the bacteria, they won't survive because they absolutely depend on them to break down eucalyptus leaves. And interestingly, the mother koala feeds the young a faecal paste, which the mother gathers from herself, and this ensures colonisation with bacteria. So this is the first faecal transplant. The koala does it, and it has to do it, otherwise it won't survive. We don't depend on bacterial digestion, so we don't need to do that. Maybe fortunately. And the way in which we ingest and the time we take to ingest food is hugely different. So here's a chimpanzee. It's eating an antelope leg or part of an antelope leg. This will take it about four to six hours. Here is a closely related primate. And this primate has an equivalent amount of meat which is consumed in about 10 minutes. So we have very different ways of eating and consuming food and our ways are ways that we've adapted over time. This is a very slow meal. This is a, a, a python, you can see its mouth there. It's consuming an antelope. It'll take about four weeks to digest that antelope. So that is very slow food. So what about us, modern humans? Modern human diets are almost entirely processed foods. Processed grains, which we were unable to consume, uh, our ancestors were unable to consume, now account for about 70% of dietary intake. So things like breads, pastas, rice, other cereals, are uh, about, on average, 70% of the modern uh, human diet. Uh, 80 or 90% of the food that is cooked in modern societies is pre-processed in one way or another. And 80% of our energy intake comes from highly processed foods. And this is some actual data. This is from the uh, US Grocery Council. And it worked, they worked out actually what they sell. So what they sell is a very good measure of what was eaten. And from the, in the US in 2012, ready-to-eat foods were about 70% of all the foods purchased and therefore consumed, presumably, and ready-to-heat was about 15%. So you can see we have a huge dependence on a processed food diet. Now, let's look at the long history of humans. Early hominins, the ancestors of humans, um, existed about 2.6 million years before now. From that period on, there is good evidence of the use of tools to prepare food. This is non-thermal food preparation. It ranges from things like you know, smashing the legs of animals to get out the marrow, or breaking nuts, or pounding things to obtain food. So non-thermal food preparation has a very long history. Cooking gradually increased, but it, about 500,000 years ago, and modern foods, cereals, milk, and other modern processed foods, are only in the last uh, few hundred years. In fact, if, if this period of human evolution were one day, then highly processed modern 
of food came up in the last 10 to 20 minutes. And what I'm trying, going to tell you is that this creates a problem of adaptation. So this is uh, some of the earliest uh, evidence of cooking. This comes from the Quezum Cave in Israel. And there are a number of halves of this type that have been found in the Middle East, uh, in southern Europe, in Spain and in Britain. And they date from around 300 to 400,000 years before now. And in these halves that have been preserved, uh, ash layers can be found with uh, fragments indicating that food was cooked, broken bone fragments that have been mechanically broken, and um, also by you can measure the re residue and you can work out the temperatures that were cooked at. They're about 500 degrees, a little bit less than some modern temperatures of food preparation. The um, first use of grains and tubers of starch is very recent in evolutionary terms. It's about 25 to 30,000 years ago. So before that, we did not eat potatoes or grain or root plants that had starches because we didn't have a way to get at them. Ways of grinding um, were developed at that time, and this comes from Mongolia. And this is a starch grain that was pulled out of, uh, of this stone. And all the archaeological evidence is that we didn't eat uh, grains and starches until quite recently. This is uh, a very interesting image. This is wheat burgle that was pulled out of a cave in Galilee and dated to 23,000 years ago. This is wheat burgle as well. And this was purchased in a market in Jerusalem in 1980. So you can see that the development of uh, the use of uh, grains and starches, although old, has continued uh, into, the, into, the, into the present. And you can still, of course, buy burgle. So ha what happened to the humans that, that got this new diet? Well, they evolved and there was, a, there was a evolutionary pressure on those humans. So uh, if you look at am amylases, as I mentioned before, a major uh, enzyme that you need to consume uh, carbohydrate. Modern populations with high starch diet have about seven copies of amylase gene. Modern populations with low starch diet have about five. Neanderthals and Denisovans, who are about 400,000 years ago, have very low copy numbers. Um, so what has happened is there has been a population-based evolution based on the fact that diet has changed. Cattle for milk production and milk products were, were first herded, mostly in Northern Europe, um, around about 8,000 years ago. And this also affected the uh, human population genetics. Some of the evidence for this is milk residues. Uh, dental calculus, which you see here, uh, is great because it preserves things that get stuck in your teeth. And if you go back and dig up some old bodies and find the calculus, you can actually find the protein or bits of the protein that are in there. And in uh, human remains from northern Europe of around about 4,000 years ago, you can actually find the beta lactogobulin, the, the part of milk. But you can't find it if you go back more than 10,000 years, although you have good preservation of human remains. So we know that milk utilisation was relatively recent. And the normal mammals, you know, rabbits, cats and, and us, become lactose intolerant after weaning. So after you've, you're weaned, then the ability to digest lactose disappears. However, in those, those groups who herd cattle, lactase, um, the ability of lactose to, to digest milk uh, persists. So in the north of Europe, about 75% of the population 
have a persistence, a mutation, a genetic mutation that allows them to drink milk into their adult life. Very interestingly, in the same region, this is north part of Finland and Norway, in the, within a few miles there are living uh, hunter-gatherers, the Laplanders who eat uh, seals and reindeer meat, and amongst those who don't drink milk, about 5% of them have the mutation because they've interbred with the other group, of course. So these genes are completely absent from Neolithic humans and at low levels up in Eurasians, that's on the, in the Caucasus area. So what has happened in 8,000 years, there has been a pressure for the persistence of particular genes. So that means that people who had the lactase persistence uh, mutation were favoured in breeding and bringing up children and surviving. But only 75%. So in this audience here, there will be people who are lactose intolerant, I'm absolutely sure. So you didn't get that mutation. So it took 8,000 years to breed into a herding population a gene that they favoured, but they didn't all get it. So this means it takes quite a long time for genetic pressure to change the gene pool uh, in humans. In this, case, in this example, about 8,000 years. And many other characteristics that have been looked at are similar. They take this sort of time. Now, the other thing that happened over evolutionary time was a change in the human gastrointestinal tract. So these graphs are the proportions of brain, gut, liver, kidney and heart in modern humans and if the modern human had retained the ratios of its cousins, the orangutans and the chimpanzees, these would be the ratios. So this is what we expected. So what has happened is the liver, the kidney and the heart have remained much the same in proportional size. The gut has shrunk. The brain has grown. And even the pictures show that. Look at the size of the head of the chimp and the head of the human. A bit idealised that human, anyway. <laughs> but uh, so evolution has moved us to have a small gastrointestinal tract, which means we have to be very efficient uh, in the way we digest. And this is some more data of this sort. So this is the colon, the fermenting part of the gut, of major uh, cousins of ours, the gibbons, simangs. Orangutan, or, orangutans, gorillas and chimpanzees and, uh, and human. So we sit quite away from them even though we're very, very closely related uh, in other ways. Our, gene our genetics is very similar. We have a much bigger small intestine. Small intestine is great for digesting processed foods, things that are ready to go and it relies on enzymatic digestion, not on a bacteria. Another change has been in our ability to bite things. We have very weak ability to break food with our jaws. What this shows here is the relationship between the bite force, so how hard you can pull down, and the area of your teeth. And these are all the primates, all the apes, except us. And you see where they sit. And this is humans. And ancient humans. So if you look at a particular molar area, say just at this point here, the bite force we can exert is about half the bite force that our cousins can exert. So we've lost size of gut and we've lost ability to chew and we've lost our ability to utilise bacteria, but we have gained our ability to process food and to take in a very wide food variety. So I'm going to pass over to Martin now, who's going to tell you some more. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks very much, John. So I'm going to start, I'm going to talk about another very topical um, topic that you will have heard a lot about. So you don't need to spend much time on the internet or on, on popular media 
to be bombarded with information about how your bacteria within your gut are affecting your brain and your health. Um, so you see here some of these, these things that I found off the internet very quickly I think are quite interesting. Here we have 33 ways that gut bacteria affect your mind and your body. This is of course popular um, media, not real science. And in fact, um, some of us, this has led to this idea, this, this talk about the gut-brain axis. And for those of us who study the brain and the nervous system that controls it, we find this a bit bemusing actually because in fact there is a lot of evidence that there are lots of connections between the brain and the gut that don't involve these bacteria here. And in particular there are lots of nerves that carry information bi-directionally between the brain and the central nervous system, that is the, the brain and the spinal cord, and the gut here. So this is both back and forth. And some important nerves to, to mention here are nerves that come out of the brainstem here, the base of the brain, a particular nerve called the vagus nerve, which I'll talk about some more. There are also lots of nerves down here that come out of the spinal cord that interact with and send information to and from the gut via electrical <coughs> signals. There are also lots of hormones that send information back and forth between the nervous system and the gut. And one you might have heard of is a hormone called ghrelin, which is produced in the gut and has a big effect on our appetite and our, 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 the, the motivation to eat food. So this is, this is a, a complex system. Yes, it is true that there are lots of bacteria in our gut, something like a trillion of them, and they do produce things which can affect the nervous system. But also the nervous system has uh, effects on the bacteria in our gut and our gut itself, the function of the gut affects these bacteria and of course vice versa. So why then if this system is so complicated has there been such a focus on bacteria in health recently? Well if you look at various diseases which we know affect the brain and these are listed here, uh, you'll see that uh, a large number of them actually are associated with disorders of the gastrointestinal system or the gut. So that includes uh, Parkinson's disease here which is associated very strongly with constipation. Lots of people with Parkinson's disease report constipation but also slow stomach emptying. Multiple sclerosis here which is another disease of the nervous system is associated with constipation. Huntington's disease again associated with constipation but also problems of swallowing and incontinence. Um, these are all what we might call neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, we also have developmental diseases like autism which are associated particularly in children with uh, gastrointestinal symptoms like bloating, constipation and diarrhoea. And we also have what might be termed environmental diseases, things like stress or post-traumatic stress disorder, which you know affects the brain, but also is associated with uh, increased incidence of gut diseases, and in this case, strongly associated with a disease called inflammatory bowel disease, which I'll talk about some more. Schizophrenia, again, another disease which is probably partly genetic, partly environmental, associated with inflammatory bowel disease, and also an increased incidence of uh, what's called irritable bowel syndrome, which I won't talk about, and again anxiety, depression, abdominal pain and inf uh, irritable bowel syndrome are a big uh, scene in a lot of people with these diseases. Okay, so there's clearly some sort of link between the brain and the gut, and a lot of cases we know that's probably due to um, degeneration which occurs in the nervous system, in the brain, but also at the same time in the nervous system which controls the gut, which is the enteric nervous system, which of course John has a long history of investigating. Um, but what people have realised more recently is that all of these diseases are associated with potentially bad changes in the microbiota, the bacteria and other organisms which are present within our gut. So these potentially bad changes that are seen in all of these diseases are have been termed dysbiosis, that is a problem with the microbiota. Uh, dysbiosis is a term which I want you to remember. So the idea has come about that perhaps these changes that you see in the gut bacteria may be associated in some way with these uh, problems both in the gut but also in the nervous system. But 
really what has not been d demonstrated at all well in most of these cases is any sort of causal link. So really the question of which came first, the dysbiosis or the disease, really is, uh, has not been established very well. But we do know that many of these brain diseases have, uh, can affect strongly our gut microbes. So the, 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 many of these effects are probably going this way, from the brain to the gut microbes. And the way this occurs is in various ways. First of all, we know that disorders of the nervous system can cause things like poor diet um, and altered diet. Uh, and also, these disorders of the nervous system can uh, induce what we call gut dysfunction. So problems in the gut, which we know will also. So mm -hmm. gut, the diet, your diet, and the function of your gut have very strong effects on your gut microbes. And we also know that uh, hormone dysfunction may also do the same sorts of things. So there is the, the possibility, in fact, or probability that brain disorders are affecting our microbes. We do know, however, that these microbes, and there are, as I said, there are large numbers of them, do produce products, bacterial products, which are released into the bloodstream and can affect, uh, have effects back on the, the brain. So there is the possibility, in quite, and in, case, in some cases it's been shown that there, there are mechanisms by which these bad mac microbes may make these brain diseases worse. Um, so there's a possibility that you might interrupt this cycle by altering the diet here, but as most of you in this room will know, you do not need a brain disease to have a poor diet. <laughs> so how then does our diet affect our gut microbes? Well. It, it does have a big effect, and this is basically because, as illustrated in this diagram here, your gut contains lots of different sorts of bacteria. And in most cases, in the healthy state, you have a wide variety of these bacteria. Um, however, if you, if you alter, this is basically a, a, a battle in your, your belly, a battle for supremacy. These microbes are battling to survive, and it's a case of survival of the fittest. And the fittest really means the bacteria which is most adapted to its environment. Now, if you change the environment, you're going to change the outcome of that battle. So how do you change the environment? Well, you change your diet. So one of the things that, one of the changes that has occurred more recently in our diets is, of course, a big, very big increase in our intake of refined sugars. So this is data from the uh, US Department of Commerce looking at the per capita intake of sugar, refined sugars, in the US from about 1820 up to about 2005. And what you see is this massive increase in our per capita intake of refined sugars. So this is going to have a big effect on, the, on our gut microbes. There's no question about that because, in fact, gut microbes or bacteria love sugar. Okay, so if you try and grow a bacterium in a dish, give it some sugar, it will be very happy. So you might think, oh, this is the US. Well, we're, much, we're, we're, you know, we're not like the US and Australia, are we? We're, well, if you look in a per capita basis, in fact, Australia is actually worse. Okay? So per capita, 40 kilograms of sugar per year. Now, I hope for your own sake you're not in this category, but that, of course, means there are people who are, if there are people who are taking in less than this, there are others who are taking in more. Uh, this is uh, data from the US Food and Agriculture Organization, in, uh, so looking at the amount of uh, sugar consumed as a whole divided by the number of the population. So it's not all bad news, this idea that bacteria can uh, affect, possibly might release things affect you, that affect your brain, leads to the idea that you can potentially affect or have good effects by altering your diet. An example of this here is what's known as the ketogenic diet and its use in a brain disease called epilepsy. So epilepsy is um, unwanted or inappropriate electric electrical activity in the brain that we call seizures. And in uh, this very recent paper, it was shown that this uh, ketogenic diet, that is a high protein, high fat and low carbohydrate diet here, can have effects on the brain by altering the, uh, the gut microbes. Okay, so we, what these people showed in the laboratory animals that were prone to seizures, that if you feed them this ketogenic diet, you alter the microbes within the gut, 
And that leads to a reduction in a certain type of product from these bacteria within the, within the, the, um, the bloodstream, uh, a particular type of amino acids here, and that reduction leads to this reduction in seizure activity in these animals. So it's actually been known for quite a while that, that, that a ketogenic diet might be useful in people with epilepsy. And in fact, this is used clinically. So a ketogenic diet can improve symptoms in some cases in, in humans, but not being a clinician, I'm not certainly uh, not the person to ask about that. But, and in fact, it's this, while this is done, it's done under strict medical supervision generally, particularly in, in children, because this is a very quite extreme diet which can have its own health consequences. So th that's something to be aware of if you are considering that sort of ketogenic diet. Okay, so there is another way that these bacteria in our gut might affect our brains, or can affect our brains, we think, and that's via activating the immune system and causing a process called inflammation. Now, we know that if we have the wrong sort of bacteria in our gut, or indeed if the, the, those bacteria get into the wrong place, that will activate our immune system, which is designed to protect us from infections. And the first thing that happens under those circumstances is this process called inflammation. So I'll just quickly just give you a background of inflammation. This is a very broad, uh, basic introduction. What is inflammation? Well, this is the body's initial or fast reaction to tissue damage or infection. And it generally involves immune cells reacting to microbes or bacteria. This is an immune cell here reacting to the bacteria that leads to the release of things which are going to damage these bacteria. It also leads to sort of reddening of the tissues, as you can see here. And the, the things that these immune cells release to act on these microbes can also damage the tissues around them. So this is something which needs to be kept in, in careful balance. So acutely this is important and it's good, but chronically this is harmful. And we know now there are a whole range of diseases which are thought to be involved with inflammation being out of balance. Or, or, uh, and you can see, you can read this list for yourselves, but I'm going to concentrate uh, for the next couple of slides on this disease here called inflammatory bowel disease. So I apologise, some of these images are going to be a bit confronting, but it is quite a confronting disease. It's a nasty disease that is, can be life-threatening under certain circumstances. There are two main types. The first is Crohn's disease, which affects the small intestine, and ulcerative colitis, which affects the large intestine. And this is uh, in, uh, what happens under endoscopy that's a very, uh, can be a, a critically, um, uh, can lead to Basically, you needing to have your intestines removed and you can have, uh, be given a colostomy bag here, which, which of course collects the, the content that comes through the gut. So we know now that this uh, disease is due to an inappropriate reaction to gut bacteria. And we know that because if you look, if you study this disease in animals, you find that if you look at germ-free animals, animals which are bred to not contain any bacteria, then the disease doesn't occur. And if you're a human and you have your faecal stream diverted, that is, if you have something like this, a colostomy bag, then down further in your gut, the inflammation goes away. If you reconnect the gut via uh, surgery, then the inflammation will recur. This occurs in areas where the bacterial counts are highest, antibiotics, which is, of course, Kill, uh, are designed to kill bacteria and anti-inflammatory drugs are useful in the treatment of this disease, but in most cases, uh, particularly uh, certain types of the disease, surgery is required to remove the affected bowel. So 70% of people with Crohn's disease, say for instance, require surgery, and one third uh, will require surgery within five years of diagnosis, and that's despite the fact that we have very advanced anti-inflammatory drugs. This is a, shows a piece of gut that's been resected and this is basically what happens after you resect the gut. You have to sew the, the remaining pieces of the intestine together. Unfortunately, this, uh, this is not a cure. After one year, eight out of 10 patients show some sign of recurrence after surgery and one in 10, even after just one year, will require further surgery. So this is a nasty disease which we really need to find better ways to treat. Our colleagues at the Austin, including uh, Dr. Peter de Cruz here, is, has shown that understanding that ba bacteria may cause this can help to treat the disease. So we've shown that by looking at 
what bacteria are present in people's gut, he can determine whether people are likely to respond well to surgery. So if people who have uh, require surgery seem to have different bacteria in their guts to people that don't and have Crohn's disease, and likewise, six months after surgery, people that are going to rec have recurrence of the disease have different bacteria to those that don't. That just, this just illustrates that here in a more uh, scientific uh, view of the, just this is looking at the, the plotting the different bacteria in the gut. So one way we might treat this is by stimulating nerves. If you remember at the start of the talk, I suggested that the nervous system can uh, inhibit uh, uh, um, things like inflammation. So one nerve that does this is the vagus nerve, which is in the neck here. So this is a device here which is designed to stimulate this vagus nerve. And we know that this vagus nerve stimulation has a very powerful, powerful effect on inhibiting inflammation. And that's from various studies in animals. This is being used uh, now in uh, a, a limited study in inflammatory bowel disease in humans with limited success and sub substantial side effects. And that's really because this nerve here comes down and it doesn't just control the gut, but it also controls several organs in the chest here. And the most important ones are, of course, the lungs and the heart. So if you stimulate this nerve here, you're going to have effects on the lungs and the heart, which is not a good thing. So our approach to this in, in, in research we've been doing is to develop an implant which will stimulate this vagus nerve as it comes down the esophagus underneath the heart and the lungs so that we're only stimulating the nerves that, which uh, control the gastrointestinal tract. And, uh, so, and this is just illustrating the, the dissections of human vagus so that we can develop this technique. And at the moment, we're preparing for a clinical trial, which we hope will start next year, where we use this in patients with uh, Crohn's disease. And we're hoping we can tell whether this treatment might not just uh, inhibit the inflammation, but might no normalise the bacteria in the gut. Um, so that's, that's a, just a little uh, to end on the sort of research we're trying to do in the lab at the moment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so you can see that these are highly relevant to uh, clinical medicine. And what I told you earlier was that for human populations to adapt their genetics to new diets takes a long time. It takes eight or 10,000 years. So I'm going to briefly talk about what we are seeing now as our diets have changed uh, very dramatically. So this is the sort of diets that humans have adapted in the last 50 years. These diets didn't exist before that. And these are some photographs. Uh, deep fried Mars bars are, a, are quite a new development, um, as are heat <coughs> boiling in fats. Uh, these fat vats can get up to eight or 900 degrees centigrade. This used to be chicken, and now it's whatever this is. And here's a steak. You think that's bad? So have a look at the rest. So these are the photographs that were taken in the last five years. Look at the new things you can eat. Deep fried butterballs. <laughs> Deep fried Twinkies and Oreo cookies. Deep fried. And you can add other things, extra cream and chocolate or caramel. I like this one. Deep fried chocolate bacon on a stick. And if you can't, get, can't give up your coffee, you can also have deep fried coffee balls. <laughs> so what this illustrates is that our diets have changed dramatically and all of this has happened in the last 50 years. <coughs> and this is what's happened to our livers. Non-alcoholic liver disease was almost unknown uh, in the 1940s. Now in Australia, it's approaching 50% in middle-aged Western countries, in, in the middle-aged Western countries. This is a normal liver. This is fatty liver disease. Half the people over 50 in Australia will be going towards this. So we're not coping uh, with the new diets. Also, 
there is even more dramatic changes in diet that are occurring. So now we, we see protein being made from bacterial broths. We, we have genetic engineering to add things to things. Like, so soybeans now can be produced with more omega-3. Canola can be genetically modified to produce vitamin B in canola. We don't, we don't get vitamin B much in our diet. It comes from bacteria. Um, nanoparticle nutrient cargos are being developed. These have been advocated because you waste even less time on eating. You can get all the nutrients you need in about a minute. So if you have three, three meals a day, you only waste three minutes. I'm going to talk a little about cowless beef. This is a very interesting development and uh, insect farms are now being developed. This is the, the new technology of cowless beef. So you start with a cow or maybe a sheep and you extract from that cells that you can grow called stem cells, so they're cells from the cow. You put that, those cells into industrial sized fats. These fats are about six or eight metres high. You add growth factors and culture broth and these cells grow and the growth factors are to turn the cells into muscle cells. Then you extract the muscle cells and you put them under a little bit of tension so they mature. Then you make them into hamburger meat and then you eat it. So we can see that there's been, uh, there are, have been dramatic changes in diet and there continue to be um, dramatic changes uh, in our diet. These are the drivers. Why are we doing this? So this is two graphs. This is the human population and this is the population growth from uh, 1950 uh, to the present and projected to 2050. From just over two, million, uh, sorry, 2 billion people, we are now at about 8 billion and we're destined to go on this graph to about 9 billion. We have to feed those people. But the thing is, as people become more wealthy, they want more protein. So this graph is wealth, this is wealth per capita, and this is the intake of meat from livestock. So if you're poor, you can't afford meat. As you get richer, you move up this curve. And here's Australia, we're one of the winners. We, we eat more meat than other people. Luxembourg actually is, the, is a big winner, but they're very rich too. Interesting, Japan. Japan is an interesting country because these are the most long-lived of modern industrial societies. And they fall off the curve. And they don't have nearly enough, not enough red meat. So you, these are the drivers. They're pushing um, food production into new areas, into new foods, and we have to um, survive with that. Now, I'm going back to my graph. So what I've told you is that ancient pre-humans prepared food non-thermally. They had food preparation techniques. Thermal food production was introduced about uh, 400,000 uh, years ago. And cereals, milk and modern foods have been developed very, very recently. Our latest changes that we've ta I'm talking about now are in the last 50 years. The evidence suggests that humans can adapt, that is, you can get a genetic shift in human populations if there's a pressure to do that over a period of about 10,000 years. You can't do it over 50 years. So, any questions? <laughs>